I'm excited to welcome onto the podcast, Peter. It's so good to have you here today. Ah, thank you for having me. It's, it's been a while. I've been meaning to come on, but I, I've just been, uh, had other directions. Well, I know. I mean, you've had, uh, it's so funny just seeing the interviews that you've done. You've, you've been on Good Morning America. You were on Kevin Hart's show and Snoop Dogg. That's super cool. Harry Connick Jr. Today, it's got to be a breakthrough moment in Brisbane on this, in this podcast. I mean, how are you feeling? I must be pretty nervous. I, I, I wish everyone could see my hand. It's trembling right now. <laughs> Thanks so much for the compliment. I love that <laughs> for playing into it. Peter, it's been 22 years since we graduated high school. And before we hit record, we we're just quickly talking about life and decades and time passing by mm. and expectations. And you sort of reflected and said, oh, wow, yeah, life is very different for you. I was reading an article The Guardian wrote about you. It's such a great article. I think 2019. I was talking about this moment where at the, your first Olympics in, in Rio, there was an opportunity and you were told that you weren't really allowed to wear the traditional attire of, of Tonga, but you went ahead and did it anyway. Can you talk us through that moment, what you were thinking um, when you had that decision point? It, I went through a lot of life following rules. You know, following what everyone else was telling me to do and you kind of reach a well you should reach a point where you start questioning things right and you start off by questioning your parents and what they told you and where they got it from but so that moment was I was told that I, I couldn't wear the traditional attire I, I had to wear a suit and a tie and mind you I don't mind a good suit and tie but you know but for this moment I thought this is you're about to walk in front of the world as a national representative to represent a nation that hasn't been around for 60 70 years right but that's been around for a thousand years 50 70 years you know if we were just a new nation maybe I'll you know fall in line and put on the suit and tie but I went that doesn't make sense to me because still in Tonga we still dress up now dress up traditionally you go to any Polynesian island uh, anywhere in the Pacific you see people in national dress when they're doing traditional things so why would I in my head why would I not do that it just didn't make sense but then I've got these authorities telling me you can't do it you have to be like everyone else I said the reason I'm here at the Olympics is because I'm not like anyone else in the way I think right anyone could be here if they think that you know in a certain way but thinking differently is part of the reason I you know I, I got here and I was able to, able to overcome my own hurdles to get here after years and years of trying and so we had the we had the national dress my coach and myself we were in on it so we had it and at the Rio Olympics you had on every corner the, the media didn't show this on every corner you had machine gun soldiers right at the within the Olympic Village which is something you don't see at Olympic villages outside of each building you had about five army army people with machine guns you know just a, you, you go down the lift to go to the common area there's five uh there's five machine guns standing at the bottom right and then once you leave the village every corner for 20 kilometers you've got turrets and an army and i'm like oh so they take security pretty you know <laughs> pretty serious so anyway i thought well just go you know you got to, you've got to got to take the risk great risk great reward no risk no reward safe life calm mm, slightly boring right so we we took the traditional gear and we put it under our under our shirts so we we, we went in as normal right we had like a button-up shirt and the like he, he could see the, the you know the big square and the bags and of stuff we're not allowed to take bags in there's foreign dignitaries in the audience and you know like you have the leaders of all yeah, countries yeah. there what are these guys bringing in so i pulled it out and i was like there's no way this guy's stopping me now i pulled it out he looks at it and i said tradition tradition culture culture tradition tradition culture uh tonga tonga and i just kept walking right he's he's staring at me trying he's, he's trying to stop me there's three other security guards trying to stop me but the opening ceremony is getting closer and closer <laughs> and there's hundreds of 
other athletes lining up behind me to go through security. And I, you know, so I just projected confidence. Just like, no, I'm meant to be here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's been, of course, it's been approved. Yeah, definitely. I just walked through. And so we walked on through. And so we, we got, we get there. And then my coach said, okay, we're going to wait until, until they go through the letters A, B, C, each country, Australia. And when we get to about L, and pull out the costume, quickly put it on. No one has it. It's too late then, right? <laughs> so the officials have, have no, can't stop us. So we get to L, quickly dug out the back. Do, 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 you know, like we're there at the back. Is your heart just racing as you're doing this? I found it, uh, I found Excellent. it exciting. Yeah. Right? Because I was doing something I thought was right. I had, at, at that stage, I had no idea what, uh, you know, what some of this was, what it would mean to other people. To me, it was just like in Tonga, you go for a traditional dance, put on all the gear. Um, and then we, we kind of walked up, walked up to the group and uh, they looked at us and we're like, let's go guys. And again, projected the, they were shocked, right? Cause we, we weren't wearing the gear. And at this, they didn't know what to say, but it's too late. You've already been announced as the flag bearer. You can't change that, yeah. right? Once you're there, you're there. <laughs> the person's already come, put the flag in your hand. It's like, let's go. And then we just kept walking, right? Because you can't, you're not gonna, no one's gonna cause a scene. You know, you don't wanna be. Yeah. So we just, we walked out and it's about a kilometer from the, the secondary stadium to the main stadium. So you're walking along these tunnels and on the roads and there's people lining it. And something was different this time. There was people everywhere, like just taking photos. And I had never, remember, I had never had that exposure to anything before. And I felt a little bit, oh, something's up, right? Like something's up. Um, and at this stage, the officials were seeing this as well. And, and they were getting in the mood. Like they were, I think they were enjoying it probably a little bit more than I was. I, I w wouldn't say that I was overly loving it. It was more that I was a, just a bit excited to be marching at the Olympics. That's did you feel out of your body or did things slow down? Things slowed right down. Mm. I, and I had the probably the most surreal moment just before we went to step out. So there's a big uh, black curtain and you don't know the size of of the stadium or who's in there until that until they say Tonga and then you st step through the curtain moves aside and then it shuts behind your your team and I stepped out and there were hundreds of thousands of people and the lights just hit you because you're walking in sort of half dark at the back mm -hmm. the lights hit you the people and they and and there's kind of like this Actually, I remember <laughs> if you're watching this on, on YouTube, Peter's like, his eyes are just, you know, are raised. And I think I remember seeing that in the footage. Like, it, 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 there was a moment where you're like, oh, like, I could sense the, the overwhelm and what is this? Well, the, I, I, because I had never experienced that level of anything before. No, right? and many of us weren't in our lives. And I, I, I think... There's probably a lot of athletes who probably had a similar experience. Like it wasn't that it had anything to do with the flag or the traditional dress. It's just that moment you step out after a, a lifetime of trying to be an Olympian. And then it's that first step out into the stadium of an opening ceremony. That's when it all goes boom, click. I'm an Olympian. And everyone's here for me, right? You, you think mm -hmm. it's for me, but mm -hmm. it's also for them. Mm -hmm. and everyone thinks the same thing. And it's, and I walk through, and and I just kind of look. I saw this big camera there. I was like, as in, you know, this is my excitement, and that ends up like, you know, and then we uh, that ended up being a big thing, and we walked on through, and then within. Uh, a few minutes people are coming up to me athletes mm -hmm. you know and they're saying Do you know you're trending on you're trending on every major um, uh, social platform I said what does trending mean 
like that was the level of my naivety to what to what social media was yeah, what what yeah. that whole life was so what's trending they said everyone's talking about you on twitter or on whatever i didn't even have a twitter at this stage right you didn't have twitter at that stage no i'd only just got an instagram um mm-hmm. so i yes it turns out someone created a twitter for me it wasn't me they then had it verified <laughs> somehow i don't know we got a blue tick and someone was um <laughs> was turned into me for a couple of years until I kind of went, oh, better go and do something about that and went and had Twitter and I shut it down. Mm -hmm. So I missed out on all those Twitter people. But, yeah, surreal, surreal moment. Thank you for taking us there. I think you told that story in such a beautiful way. Um, I didn't know that there were machine guns and I think what's interesting, it reminded me of a story I heard on a podcast. There's a guy that I follow called Don Miller. And he talks about a friend, Bob Goff. They were, they were in, I think they were in some uh, Texas or some some state in America, and there was a movie being shot, and they just wanted to see what was all, what was going on. So they just grabbed a couple of electrical cables and just walked into where the movie was filming, and, and everyone was like, "Yep, that they're meant to be here, right?" Because <laughs> that's like, as you spoke about, just walking with confidence. Um, when everything though is going, like if I was to see machine guns and you're right, like we see authority and we're so brought up, like we both went to a private like Lutheran school where we're taught to like, you know, toe the line and make sure that you follow the rules. So in your life, you spoke about being an Olympian required you to think differently. Mm-hmm. What really brought that about for you? So I wanted, uh, I wanted to be an Olympian since I was 11, 12. Mm-hmm. And I tried every year. So I went, I tried for the 2004 Olympics, which I I believe was Athens. I had no money to go to the Olympic qualifiers, which were over in Thailand. Uh, 2008, and and we're talking four year cycles here. Mm. It's not like you can try and you can try, fail and try again. It's like you try, you fail, you wait four years and then you try again. And if you fail again, you wait another four years. So now we're on eight, right? So I get to the 2008 Olympic qualifiers, um, make it to the final. And then in, and in Oceania, what people don't realize is that you have to be number one in the Oceania region to qualify your country. You can't be number one in Tonga. You can't be number one in Australia. I have to beat Australia, I have to beat New Zealand, I have to beat Papua New Guinea, I have to beat um, all the islands, Samoa, etc. And so there's only one spot for, for the Oceania region. And if you get silver, you go home, right? That's, uh, that's the line. 2008, I make it to the final. Um, I'm winning and then the guy kicks and I kick at the same time and my, our legs hit. And I broke a bone and did my ankle. And I kept fighting him for two more rounds and then he ends up winning because I can't, I can't walk. I then go home with a silver. And I had wanted this so badly you know, since I was a kid. This is 2008, 2004, I couldn't, I was training for it, couldn't afford to go 2008. This happens, I get silver. And that was my first real experience of real disappointment. Yeah. You know, dream level disappointment. Yeah. Because not only are you, did you miss out on your dream, which I probably could have dealt with, but I'm now... I can't walk. My coach pushed me on wheelchair uh, to the aeroplane in New Caledonia. So you're now missing the exercise gives you endorphins, makes you feel good, etc. I couldn't even walk and my dream was destroyed. So it took me a, a couple of months laying in bed. You know, not, I, I, you know, I, was I depressed? I don't think so. I think I was laying in bed because I couldn't move mixed with that at the same time and it takes you to it takes you to a place where you've really got to question what you're made of and after a couple of months of just being incapacitated or starting to get onto the crutches I went you know what from here on in for the rest of my life I'm going to look at disappointment differently and I'm never going to spend more than one day I give myself one day maximum when some when I fail at something mm. and now I've kind of got it to a point where it's maybe an hour or two sometimes I laugh as I'm failing 
So that's 2008 silver. I then go to 2012, four years later, make it to the final. What is going through your mind before this final? I, I had gone to the World Championships eight weeks before that mm. final to try and qualify. Because if you get number th top three in the world. Before the final, 2012. Okay, so 2012, before the final. Eight weeks before the final, tear my, uh, my knee ligament. And you have to remember, this is your life dream. So it's not like I'm going to go and not do this. I want to go and I, I have no choice. So I, uh, I had six, actually it was about six weeks. We get to, I make it to the final again and again in New Caledonia. My knee was stra strapped to high heaven. We had so much strapping tape on that knee and I could only kick with one leg. I'm going into a Taekwondo <laughs> tournament. With one leg. You know, with, with one leg against the guy that had beaten me before, right? Beat me twice before. I walk in, I'm winning. And then his coach tells him something after the first round and he changes his stance. And I went, oh no, I could tell straight away that, so he had, no, he, they figured out I was only kicking with the one leg <laughs> after the first round. Got a silver medal. 2008, silver medal. 2012, silver medal. Miss out on the Olympics again. That night I went back to the room with my coach and we sat there. He said, he said, brother, <laughs> brother, it's okay to be, it's okay to be upset. I said, no, I was upset in, in, in 2008. I was upset when I lost the match. Let's go for dinner. Let's go and be happy. Right? This is a few hours after. I said, I'll give myself tonight. We'll go get some food that we probably shouldn't eat. You know, <laughs> we'll have, have all the, all the tasty food and then. So we went out, had dinner, and by the next morning I was good again. And I said to myself, what's next? What's next? What can I do next? And I didn't stay in that, sp I didn't stay in that space. I learned from 2008. I was true to my word that I would never stay in a space of being uh, uh, depressed or upset or over something which I have given everything, mm. everything for. And that's what made me happy was I gave there was no more I could have done. Can I ask you a quick question just there? Some people, including myself, I'm sure I've, I've done it, where we'll say, oh, this job, it, it's, it's frustrating me, but I'll give it a year and I'll see how things go. So we'll put our own time constraints on it. With the Olympics, that's very real. Every, like you said, every four years. Yes. Did you think if t I'm going for 2016 and that's like the go, no go date or what, what was it? Like how, how did you pull yourself up after There wasn't, that? There, to me, <laughs> And I think everyone has this. Yeah. And if I can give this across to the listeners as some sort of a gift, is that for me there was no there was no date on it. I knew from the moment that I decided to be an Olympian at the age of twelve that I was going to be an Olympian. It, it, it was, and and this is, and it probably falls into relationships as well. Mm. And you know, maybe maybe that's somewhere you want to go with this interview mm. or not. Um, because I think it kind of defines people as well, is people won't understand, people won't see your dream, right? No one will see it as clear as you will see it. And to me, I always, I knew it. I knew I was going to be an Olympian. Four years, ah, less than ideal, having to wait another four for another shot. But it was, it was a matter of time. If I threw enough punches, one was going to land, right? <laughs> One was going to land. And um, which then took us to 2016, which was a whole new, you know, whole other story. But uh, yeah, most certainly everyone has something in them which they believe in and which they have to be okay with the fact that other people won't see it. Mm. But they've got to keep going anyway. That's hard. And so and I think that relates to something I wanted to ask you because you're talking about this dream and this conviction of mm. being an Olympian. And that's like really, I guess that's associated with your identity. So you're like, what does an Olympian do? They train every day, they punch, they kick, they get fit, they eat well, all that sort of stuff that you were doing. Yet a lot of time we then, let's just say we have a dream, but then we're looking around and we're seeing evidence that maybe we're not there yet and we can get crushed by 
what other people are telling us and maybe it's not possible and maybe the people that we surround ourselves with aren't living that way or doing that thing. How are you able to sort of cast that aside, cast the evidence aside of what's happening today and, and play for that dream? You have to be careful about the people we keep around yeah. us as well. Uh, I mean, that's certainly a, a strong element of it is remove people. Did you do that? 100%. Wow. 100%. Um, probably more so in relationships. Yeah. More so in relationships because friends, they kind of let you do your, th or good friends just kind of let you do your thing. And then when you fail, they're like, huh, well, that didn't go to plan. That's when you want to go fishing. Right, like that's that's what a true friend is. Not you should, mm, mm, mm. you know. Even even I try to be this myself to my friends. If they fail at something, I have to be very careful of the language I give them. Right, rather than oh maybe you should, you know, you're getting too old for that. I'm like oh man, that didn't go to plan. What's next? You know what? Yes. What, what are we going to do differently? Yeah, yeah. Um, so what was the what was the original question? I kind of went off on a tangent. Yeah, my question was like, it's you're getting so you're accumulating evidence. There's three years now where Nine you've been years. unsuccessful. You want to be an Olympian. Twelve years. How do you twelve? <laughs> okay. Like, how do you cast that aside? Because I think there's there's moments every day where we can get we can get defeated, and and you've got two choices, right? One, you pick yourself up and keep going. The other is you take that into consideration and go, right, maybe this isn't for me. Maybe I try something else. Did you ever have a pivot point where you, I mean, it, it sounds like you did it, that you, this was your goal, but how are you able to discard like the evidence and everything else, uh, what people are saying, and then just go all go all in? Evidence. <laughs> I think it really comes down to how you view evidence as well. Like, do you, your internal evidence has to be stronger than your external evidence. And your internal evidence is your conviction. Mm. Um, I mean, there's, there's a reality aspect. So say you have, <laughs> I'm not very really politically correct, but say you That's have fine. a midget. <laughs> wants to be the NBA yes. star right like there's there are physical there are physical limitations or restrictions but then even if I was his friend who am I to tell him that he can't right what kind of friend would I be mm -hmm. but so other than that I always saw it as if someone else has done it well, what makes them so so special like I love that they've done it but why can't I why can't you why can't any of us not that. You know, evidence. Stack the evidence in your favor. Always, <laughs> it's what it's what it's what we all do now when we're watching media, right? We choose a we choose a side, yeah. one way or another, and then we kind of blind ourselves. You know, we have a bit of cognitive dissonance. Yeah. And blind ourselves to to some of the realities, and I try not to be that, but I also am aware that there's probably an element of that that happens to me as well. So. It's, yeah, it's about conviction, mm. but everyone, everyone is, when I say Olympian, I want it to be an Olympian. What I'm saying is that you also have an Olympian version of yourself in you. It might not be called an Olympian. It might be called whatever it is that you want to achieve mm. or anyone else wants to achieve. And uh, it's there and it just has to be, you have to, you have to water that, you have to water that seed. Love it. Um, the the funny thing you're talking about the internal conviction and when you dropped over you saw my Peloton bike and I'm like hey do you have a Peloton and you said no no, no I have internal motivation and we sort of giggled <laughs> it was like you know I'm outsourcing my motivation to the bike just to try to create a system that, that to create the motivation and to stack the evidence so it sort of all links in um, moving on from the Olympics and your year you've mentioned um, that you have an annual goal setting process mm -hmm. and I was wondering if you could share what your process is, is with listeners and let us know, like, sure you can have a process, but then life hits you with certain things. Oh. And it certainly did for you this year with your own country, Tonga. Can you share a bit about your process and then how you've managed to weave it in with what's going on in the world for you? Sure. So I, so I was doing a, um, uh, an experience on, on Airbnb. Um, you know, they were, uh, they were, Oh, Airbnb experiences. Yes. Yeah, so they were, they were, they're, a, great. they're a sponsor of mine and, um, as an athlete, yeah. you know, we we have like, you know, some good 
good stuff going on and uh and, and i put forward an experience and what and what that was was actually taking what i do with my goal setting and then you know doing it like monthly goal cool. setting yeah right? so I'll, I'll just run people through the process i don't want to um i think it's knowledge should be shared right so at the start of each year i never have a first of january uh, goal. Uh, what I have is I don't actually write my yearly goals until the end of January. And this isn't, when I say all this stuff, it's not the right way, it's a way. Choose the right way for yourself. And the reasoning behind that is, is that um, most people start a goal too high. When I say too high, I don't mean they shouldn't have high goals. In fact, I'm, I'm actually a strong advocate for it. What I'm saying is that you have to ramp up towards your goal. You can't have not exercised for <laughs> 10 years and then I'm gonna hit the gym. That's it, this is the day, da da da. And then you smash everything down, you walk into the gym and you're lifting. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you got the guinea, guinea pig, but like, I, kind of like Tim Ferriss. I, I love it, yeah, there's a lot yeah. of guinea pigs and we're all guinea pigs in, to some degree. So first of Jan, so going back January, I set the process and I go, you know, I go deep on myself, right? Like, why don't I have it already? Like, what, what are the mental barriers? What are the physical barriers? What are the, th where is a dragon in my life that I don't want to look at? So I've got to be, so when I give these speeches, I've spoken at the United Nations, I spoke at MIT and I, and I said, I spoke about the dragon that we all have. And another way to put you're a big Bruce Lee fan. Yeah. The dragon. I, I, well, the, in, in Bruce Lee's speech, the dragon is actually positive. In, in this speech, it's more the thing that guards the gold. We mm. want the gold in our life, right? The, 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 the joy. But I have to be careful. And, you know, I, I can be open during this podcast, during, during this discussion. When I talk to people, and I worked in homeless shelters for 15 years, I understand that when you talk about things like depression, anxiety, barriers, people's demons will do anything possible to have them not hear the truth that they need to hear about themselves. Why? Because we, we, we kind of already know the truth, we just don't want to hear it, right? And then. Who the hell are you to come and tell me the truth that I have suppressed from myself? I hide that from myself, right? I don't, I, I don't want to face that. Why? Who are you to come? So then they get, people can get angry at you when you present truth. The demon doesn't like to be, the dragon doesn't like to be disturbed. He wants to just lay on that pot of gold. Um, so then I had to be careful about the language that I use, but then and then I reached a point where being careful also meant being insincere I, or being over careful. There's still ways, to, there's still smart ways to word things that you don't make people want to go and you know, hurt themselves because you, you expose the truth that they, already, that they already know. But I say this because my process is about unbearing my truth. I have so many things inside me which hold me back. What are they? Turn into the cave, go head first. You do, you, you still do. Uh, everyone does. I, I've, uh, when I say I still do, I mean I've, I've worked on. I've, for years, yeah. For years, yeah. and, and I'm, at a I, I'm at a very happy place. Yeah, right? I'm at a place where the, the dragon's like, ah, I'm They're a challenge. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We've had this battle many a time, and I always come out on top, it's buddy. Super cool, yeah. Um, but I want people to face their dragons because it's the only way through is through, is through the fear, right? But then I can't, ex I can't say to someone, this is what's wrong with you. You need to go and face that dragon, but then not arm them with a tool. Mm -hmm. I got to give them a sword, right? I got to have a sword myself when I'm going to go and battle the, the, the things inside me which are holding me back. I, I, you know, so that's where education comes in. Okay, Shit, I don't know what this dragon's going to look like, but I, I have a couple of tools. Let's see if they work. 
you go in, you fight the dragon, you come out partial, par partially scorched. Okay, that tool didn't work. What, others, what other tools do I have? Go back, okay, I gotta win, right? And then over time, you build up your resilience to the, and, and you know, to the dragon or to the thing that holds you back. And you reach a point where you're not scared of anything when it comes to something about yourself. And I think that that is what true vulnerability is, mm -hmm. is saying that you've gone to battle with yourself or the, with the parts of yourself which have held you back or make you feel sad or make you feel miserable or make you not achieve the goal that you want to achieve or, you know, or, take, or anything that takes something from you that doesn't bring joy you've gone to battle with enough times where, you, where you're just like what's the word unwithable right? <laughs> yeah I, you can say it right. <laughs> yeah. um, United Nations ambassador yeah um, <laughs> but no I think there's sometimes people don't want to hear this they want to be sometimes they just want to want a shoulder to cry on and I, uh, I understand that personality-wise, I'm not always that person for them. And when, when you go through something in life, you have to know which friends mm. or which mentors are needed at what time. I'm the mentor that will, I'll give them a bit of empathy for a period of time. But we also need a solution so that we're not sitting in the same position you know yeah that's it for 10 years in a row mm. because your time is precious mm. all of our time is precious and if I have a friend who's still in the same position then I have to question my knowledge what is it maybe I'm not doing something right and I don't want to be questioning myself all the time maybe it's just them and they are a reflection of me when I say them I might be that's me at some stage as well right um, so I don't want to be an asshole to people but We've, we've got to fight our dragons. Mm. And it, what's interesting in what you're talking about is it's our own dragons. We're not fighting or competing against anyone else. It's really yeah. just against ourselves 100%. and getting past that. I think like sometimes when I go to goal setting or looking at what I want to achieve, um, automatically I sometimes will put a filter on it. Like, I want to do this. Oh, that's not possible. Oh, but what, I, what you said earlier is that, well, the fact that someone else has done it just shows you that it is possible. And if they to do it, who's to say that you can't do it? 100%. Yeah, but it's just recognizing that and breaking your own pattern of thinking. Yeah, and it's, I think if there's a skill that people, that would really benefit listeners, it's put your effort into self-reflection, mm. right? Like, don't be scared to look at yourself through the lens of zooming out. So I've been, I've been good my whole life at zooming right out. So if there's a little problem, so this tea you made me, it had too much sugar, or it had too much milk, or it had too much tea, or the cup's too tall, or the cup's too, none of that means anything. You know, I'll go to a cafe, I'll order a coffee and they'll bring me a tea. And I've got two options. And sometimes I'll be like, hey, I kind of, can I have the, can I have the coffee? Or sometimes, sometimes I'll just be like, Today's a tea day, right? The, the, the universe is sending me tea today. The universe <laughs> is sending me tea today. I'm, I'm not going to spread negativity. I'm going to zoom right out, and I'm going to, I'm going to look at my life from the perspective that I'm in the infiniteness of the universe, mm. looking in. Does this matter? No. Does that matter? No. Do the things that we complain about matter? Probably not. Yet they're so real to us. And they give us so much pain, mm. but in reality, the majority of things are so small. I know, I mean, particularly looking now, like now that we are in this sort of connected world, we can see what's happening in overseas in places like Ukraine and in Tonga, what happened mm. um, earlier this year. Can you share what actually happened in Tonga if listeners aren't sure of like the natural disaster that occurred over there and then how you yes. quickly mobilized to help out with you know, using your influence to do that? That was really impressive. We, uh, so Tonga at the start of the year, so I, I had this goal setting process and I was kind of in the middle of it, then in the middle of January, 
um, I, I, I get these messages, are you okay? What's happening? And um, is everyone okay? And I, I check social media because that's kind of, I kind of probably get more of my news from social media than from, than from news agencies. Um, and I saw that, so there was a tsunami hit Tonga after a volcanic eruption. And this huge cloud of ash just covered the whole island and then all comms went off. No one could, so we had no idea. And I've worked in, I've worked in, you know, with the United Nations, I work for UNICEF as a um, goodwill ambassador. And I know that there's a, there's a period of time where we have to maximize to get help. That period of time is about 72 hours. You have about three days from when a disaster hits, from when you uh, as to how long, that's the period of time that you have to maximize the assistance you can get to help that country. Because that's, it's basically, that's the new cycle, right? So I thought, all comms are off. I saw images of houses getting, getting destroyed by the tsunami. I don't know what the damage is going to be. I need to, I, you know, I need get to, into gear. I need to get into gear. I, I have to be ready mm. for when, you know, for when everything is, is, uh, is back to normal. Oh, not back to normal, when, when communication is back to normal so we can see. And so I set up a GoFundMe. Within, within two or three days, we raised a quarter of a million dollars. Amazing. Well done. Congratulations. Cool, That's right? phenomenal. Yes. And I had a target of a million dollars. And I kept getting asked the question, Eve, you know, why was your target a million dollars? I said, a million dollars was an arbitrary number, but it represented the cost to rebuild a, a wing of a hospital or a, a school building or something like this. Um, and that would be my contribution. Right, that would be where I could help. Yeah. So it's just an arbitrary number, because at first I was going to put a target of fifty thousand, and I want to talk about the numbers because it's the numbers represent how how I think. Like you're anchoring. It's around eight hundred, just under nine hundred thousand dollars Australian, and that represented to me setting a goal, falling short of it, but it was an impossible goal. Right, and I think we all have impossible goals, big goals, which are, which don't make sense. Which where we have the people outside saying, you know, that's too big. You people, people won't give you, people won't donate to you five dollars because they know they think it won't make a dent. Mm -hmm. Like that, that's the fear that I said. No, oh, we can help people if we have more to help people with. Aim high. I then did one hundred and thirteen interviews in just under two weeks. Oh my gosh. Every news outlet. Turns out, turns out every news outlet has multiple parts of that outlet, right? So it's, the interview would have been like repurposed over well, they a have, thousand times. They, they have different, uh, so say you have BBC, you have BBC World, you got BBC um, in Australia, you got BBC in, you know, oh, okay. and so, I'm, so you're getting messages and, and, and calls from different people and so you're doing Re uh, repeating the same questions, the same interviews, but I thought I have to get exposure out to this because I need to bring awareness. I need to get the funds ready. We need to be ready when the communications come up. What what's their need going to be? We've got to help the people. And it was two weeks without communications. I got like my father had disappeared. No one had heard from oh him. Oh, I couldn't even contact them to see if they'd. So heard not from only him, are you trying to like do this work. And provide support. You, at, at a personal level, have no idea what's going on with your family. Our homes. We have a home in the outer islands, forty kilometers from that volcano. You know the volcano that spread halfway across the mm. world. On the water, and our home in the mainland is also on the water. And my father, seventy plus years old, living there by himself. But there's no choice, right? When you get called to action. When you get called to do something, that something sometimes is bigger than yourself. So I have to park, I have to park my personal worry. And me worrying doesn't help anyone. So it's like, okay, park that, just pray. If my father's okay, good. If the good Lord took him up to heaven above, good. That's, he's the boss, right? He's in charge, not me. So 
so that's how my you know how my mentality was but I need to help there's going to be people that need help this is what I can do raise the money and so far we have um, which is fantastic we have we've sent like what was it almost half a million uh, about uh, half a million kilograms of food that's crazy uh, containers we've almost almost there we still have a bit to go replace 10% of all the boats that were destroyed um, you're talking like every boat in the in the islands were destroyed and boats aren't a recreational no, product it's there. survival it's survival yeah. it's, it's, it's your car you can't get to hospital if you have a if you're stuck on an island, right? So we replaced close to ten percent of the boats. We've um, sent school equipment. Um, it's just been. Uh, I've listened to this and I look at you and I'm like, oh my gosh, Leanne, I need to step up <laughs> and start doing more. The universe calls you to step up, mm. and it's easy. Like, it's easy not to. The easy option is to not accept the call. Is not to accept it. Yeah. The the money. That amount of money is a blessing, but it's also a burden, mm. right? And the burden of it is that now you're responsible. Now you're responsible for smartly. I can see. I can't even say smartly properly. How, you know, how can this guy go and <laughs> <laughs> oh, for effectively using that money to help people, mm. right? And that means that the last two months. I've just been I've been doing something which I don't love just allocating alloc alloc yeah. you know doing the, the, the paperwork yeah. the emails and I've got a small team that helps me as yeah. well but it's like I need to be training <laughs> this is taking me away from this is taking me away yeah. but sometimes we're called to do something yeah. which pulls us away we have no choice amazing uh, Peter, I've got a couple, just the rapid round before we um, wrap up this conversation. <laughs> I mean, well, I could, this could be total Joe Rogan style and I could just chew your... You go on as long as you need uh, to help the listeners. I, today's, today's your day. That's all right. <laughs> Actually, I will ask you, one. My, my husband wanted me to ask you this. When you were training for the Olympics, or even now, I mean, now that you're like, you're not training for any Olympic Games right now, right? Uh, I, I'm in off-season now. What does off-season um, look like in terms of your workouts and routine? Okay, so uh, I'm in off off season. <laughs> okay. Also known so as probably... also known as Big Mac season. <laughs> <laughs> That's great to know. Yeah, he's human. <laughs> yeah, no, no. I, 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 every so often I frequent uh, fast food, but I, I know that there's a price to pay for everything, mm. but I'm willing to pay the price. If I eat this, I know I'm going to go for a longer walk the next morning. I'll make up for it, right? Yeah, there's no, there's no uh, unbalance. But in the off-off season, when I'm completely away from focused training, I always have a fallback training option. And the fallback is what we do when everything is going, not wrong, not when everything's going wrong, but when we don't want to do anything. Um, and I have a 15 minutes a day, that's it, in the off-off season. And I'll alternate between three exercises, pull-ups, one day, 15 minutes. Next day, push-up, 15 minutes. It's amazing. 15 minutes of push-ups is a lot, right? And yeah, that's you just a lot. rest and you keep going. Yeah. And the next day, lunches. Okay. Right? So that's my, that's my worst days. Yeah. And that's only 15 minutes a day. If you don't have 15 minutes a day for that, you may have, you may have to rethink what it is that you're being busy with. And then throw into that maybe a you know walk every morning, um, and then I ramp up into on season, and then that can look like two one session a day to two sessions a day to three sessions a day, coming closer and closer to competition. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's important for people to always have a fallback. Yeah, option, I like that. Which we don't have. But like our fallback option is laying in bed. And is do nothing. Netflix. Yeah, do nothing. And then I'll eat crap as well. You know what I mean? Like, because it's yeah, like so a it's perpetuating. A double, double dose of bad, Totally, right? yeah. 
So I think it's good for people to have a, a fallback option. Yeah, I like that. Thank you. I've, no one's ever, I've ever, I haven't really heard that before, having a fallback option. And now I need to think of, mine would be probably just a 15 minute run or, um, I don't even think I could do a minute of pull-ups yet. So maybe it's <laughs> working up to like 10 minutes of pull-ups, assisted pull-ups. It's, when I say that, there's a caveat to those exercises. And I think this is important in terms of exercise motivation for people. And there's a lot of people who are probably interested in exercise motivation. And the caveat is this, is that, uh, you know, when I'm telling people, they say, do I have to, should I do, I, I don't want to do squats, so I don't want to do bench press, so I don't want to do, these are things I don't want to do. I listen to, and I listen to these motivators and they say, you have to do that, you have to do the hardest thing, and I, and I, I don't necessarily agree, actually I don't agree. Mm. My opinion is that when it comes to exercise, you have to do something. Full stop. You have to do something. And you have to do something consistently. If squats stops you from going to the gym because you, you don't love them, don't do squats. Right? Even though you need them, right? Those th those legs of yours need some squats, or that chest of yours needs to be worked on, or that your lung capacity is not so good, so you should run. What's more important than what you should do is you doing something consistently. Choose what you like first. Then when you can do that consistently, add in something else. Mm. And then if you can't, and then you add in. And then if you can't do that consistently, go back to the one before. You can't do that consistently, go back to the one before. 15 minutes, if that's too much for you, do five, yeah. do yeah. two, do one. Work your way down until there's a number that you can do or a thing that you can do consistently because yeah. exercise isn't about building muscle or about bu building cardiovascular fitness it's about building a consistency habit and it's about doing it with simple things first mm -hmm. I do it as well That's when I go back into on season I'm not going to go and smash it because no. okay. I'll hate it right I have to do it slowly okay now my body is ready for the bigger things. Yeah. We go back, and that's going back to the question before about starting the new year. Mm. Your motivation is new year, new me. <laughs> Motivation's through the roof. Guess where the body is? Here, body's here, motivation's there. There's a big gap. To bridge that gap, we end up with 30th, how many days in January? 30, 31, whatever it is. 31. First day of February, we've already lost our goals. Yeah. Because we, we tried too much too soon. And that's the thing. And then the self-talk is like, oh, I can't do this. Why, why should I even try, right? You know what I mean? And it's you're, like, out, you're out for exactly, the year. Exactly, exactly. Because I really like this. Just just doing the... Um, it kind of reminds me, my friend Sean D'Souza talks about... He This is in the context of mar content marketing, like spinning plates. He's like, just try one medium. Get good on YouTube. Just do YouTube for a year. Then if you, once you've got that, got the systems, then you can add a podcast. And then you start spinning these plates. You just keep spinning one at a time. Yeah, until you see how many you can exactly. or until you start dropping plates. Yeah. Exactly, and then you're like, well, how did you do that? And as you said, it just starts from like just getting the basics right and building that consistency. 100%. And, yeah. and the other the other element, I do three two-hour sessions a day. Well, I can't do that at the moment. Oh, so should I feel depressed that I'm not what I was? No, I'll start at one 15-minute mm -hmm. session. And then what happens is we end up building, what's the word, inertia, momentum, mm. right? And it mm. turns out that YouTube session that you were talking about, mm. just do YouTube for a year. And then at the end of the year, you, you probably find that you, you, you can now... It's quicker. In Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, uh, everything else just comes within the first month. All of that because of that consistency habit that you that you created. Yeah. And also remembering that a lot of the skills we learned aren't in isolation. Like I remember when I started my original podcast... Yeah. Like I, I did 10 episodes and I will not listen back to them. Uh, people still are listening to them, but I was a very bad interviewer. I was very scripted and trying to get it perfect. And my voice was, in, it was just a disaster. <laughs> but I think as I got better at interviewing people, then I got better at facilitating workshops, a similar skill set, got better at listening. It's like you're stacking, like through that habit creation, you're just stacking all these skills that you, you've got no idea about until you start. And you just can't, you can't think your way through it. You actually have to, do, to go through it. As you said, the, the only way through is through. A hundred percent. And the formula is, it's, it's not uh, repetitive. It's, it, the formula you use to get good at exercise is the formula you use to get good at 
podcast formula for podcasts is that the formula you use to get good at exercise and it's a little bit ad nauseum because it's like you want to bring in someone and they give you some magic insight that where you just go huh but I think the where you get that magic insight where you get that that crumb that you never saw before is in the delivery of something someone delivers the same thing because the formula is the same it doesn't matter what motivational speaker some will say do the hardest you know do the hardest thing first thing in the morning some will say i'm more of a ramp up into it there is no right way there's the, only the right way for you mm. and wait you know that i i think it's about getting across to, when, when i talk I just want to give a different perspective of the same thing. It's yes. all the same thing. Yes, it is. It is. It actually thing. is all the same thing. Yeah. And there's a reason for it. It works <laughs> just because it's been reproduced. I can't tell you how to build a bicep without doing a bicep curl. How many people can you bring in to tell me how to... <laughs> it's the same thing. It's the same thing. Right? What's yeah. different with exercise and where I, I want to... You know, It's probably an area where I really I'm moving I'll probably move towards that once I have a little bit more time is a psychology of getting people off the couch the exercise the exercise itself people say you, you're, you go and train them give them a program you know, give them an exercise program I mean, most people's problem isn't the program it's just getting their ass to do something and it's easy to say that right get your ass up and do it but they're not doing it in mass in mass people aren't doing it that's the magic that's the that's where i believe the the magic is is getting them from wherever it is that they're sitting get from you know those pringles in bed those doritos from there to wherever it is that they need to be mm. that gap once they're there let the trainers let the trainers deal with that yeah. This is all the psychology stuff. Yeah. This is all the, the mental stuff. That's I think that's where that's where I'm heading to. For your passion, I was, I was going to ask you about your future, and it sounds like that's that's the zone. And I think you can absolutely serve in such a great way in helping people. And it's funny, like we talk about stacking it, and you said the exercise is like the core finish. Like, and I totally find there's some days where I'm really productive, and I've I've started off the day with exercise, and I feel really mm -hmm. good. Other days where I've just like gone from my bed straight to the computer. And then like mid morning, I'm like, oh, I've got no energy. Like how I'm going to get through today. And it's just because I haven't done, like I haven't been outside. I haven't connected yes, yes, with yes. my breath or anything like that. Um, so oh, for me, sun. it's the, the sun. Yeah. Yes. Cause you follow uh, Andrew Huberman. He yeah, talks yeah, about, yeah, yeah, yeah. you need to get like 10 minutes Circadian of sunshine. Rhythms and Brilliant. Yeah. I mean, that's like, that's like the like top high performance sort of stuff. But yeah, as you yeah. said, it's, uh, it really just starts with that basic pattern of what will it take you and it, and Get all this, all this advice, but what is actually going to resonate with you the most, and how can you optimize for yourself? Take that and put that in your yeah, pocket. Yeah, there's, yeah, that's good. There's a thing around that which is very important, and that's that's the idea of failing. Happy. Don't, I don't like that word. <laughs> well, failing I, I, happy. I use the words. I use fail happy. Wow. A fail to me just means uh, not achieving something that you wanted to achieve. Yeah, fail happy. And, and, and you know, there's other languages. It's, it's it's a game of semantics, right? We yeah. can call it. Um, I, I, I don't fail, I learn, etc, etc. Mm. Um, but I use the words failing happy, which means that, okay, I didn't get it this morning. I woke up at this time, I didn't get out, I didn't get the sunshine, I'm a, you know, I'm a, I'm a failure, or I'm this, or I'm that. It's like, each day is a reset, right? You have the opportunity every single day, which is the, the blessing that we've been given to try again. And my failings, or the times where I didn't get what I wanted, they end up on newspaper headline, right? I, I go to the kayak world championships after two weeks in a kayak, and I come into the starting line, the wind's pushing me, I drift out of the starting lane. This is everyone, I can oh wait, I can, 
I don't know if you saw the video, right? Play it on this. Play it on this thing. I'll put it in the show notes. Yeah, oh, it's like the most embarrassing. So you're the start line in the kayaks. I'm going off course. Oh my god! I come into the thing. The kayak's being drifted off, (laughs) and I I I went on. I went on Good Morning. Was it Good Morning America? I went to New York and announced it. I'm going to be a kayaker. Three sports, three Olympics. Went in. Everyone's waiting with the, the the news camera things. I come in. First race after two weeks on a kayak. They even put me in a fishing kayak because they saw I was that bad. <laughs> Come into the start line. Wind drifts me around. Or everyone in the stadium. I think, oh, this isn't going to plan. I come back in. And I pedal back in. I come into the starting gate. And I start drifting again. And they, and they couldn't wait. They, and Mark gets it. Go. <laughs> I'm facing into the audience. Everyone's <laughs> going this way. And I'm facing the audience. So they went home, they made a coffee, they had breakfast, and I and I was still like slowly pedaling <laughs> my big kayak. Was your baby. face red? Like did you what, what the heck? It, it, like, you know, what goes through your head, right? When So when I talk about external validation, that's what I'm talking yeah. about. I get to the finish line and I try to sneak my way back to the kayak, you know, to the put my kayak yeah, yeah head down yeah and then I hear this call lane eight lane eight to media I get I get off I paddle up to the media station they put a microphone in my face Peter you must feel devastated right emphasis emphasis of failure yeah, yeah, yeah. you must feel devastated that you know with your performance today and I went on the contrary, <laughs> I couldn't be happier. They said, why? I said, I've got a new PB. They said, but you've never raced before. I said, yeah, well, that's why it's a new PB. <laughs> and I said, on top of that, I got a national record. They said, but Tong has never raced in, in professional kayaking before. I said, yeah, that's why I got a national record. Couldn't be happier. Can only get better from here. Amazing. Ends up being the title of the... That is amazing. I love that attitude. I wish we could, I mean, I shouldn't say, I just wish you could like, you know, with Bluetooth, you can send people things or airdrop, you can airdrop photos. I wish you could airdrop that attitude to all of us. I mean, you're doing it right now through this podcast. I I would love everyone to to be okay with being, that's why, that's why we're not doing things is because we're scared. You're scared what your mum's going to say. You're scared what your friends are going to say. You're scared that your partner's going to look at you differently. So refreshing because and the reason I don't care isn't because I don't want to achieve a goal it's because internally you fought that dragon enough times that if you fought, if you fight a dragon internally it doesn't matter what Bob or Suzanne says <laughs> they, they could say you're the worst kayaker in the world and you're like who are probably, you? <laughs> Bob. probably <laughs> second worst but yeah probably close right it just it doesn't it, it off, water off ducks back yeah, how yeah. you frame things is mm. more important than letting the world frame them for you. That's why I love it's all up to us. Um, Peter, I'm going to take you through the rapid round now. Hit me. Okay, so a couple <coughs> questions. Did you want to... Want to meditate? <laughs> so quick questions. I ask all my guests these questions. Um, what is a book that shaped the way that you think? Uh, as a man thinketh. Thank you. What's a favorite app or tool that you think we should all download immediately? I think we should download less apps and use our telephone less. (laughs) Totally agree. (laughs) I might do like that. A few of my guests have actually said, don't download anything. I just was like, I might replace that question. Yeah, Yeah. it's a, our phone, our phone was meant to liberate us, but sometimes it's our jailer as well. It is our jailer. Um, What's a song that gets you fired up? You know, I, if people listen, if people listen to what I'm listening to in the gym, they would think that there's something wrong with me, right? I'm deadlift. <laughs> Biblical quote: If you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, "Move from here to there," and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. Wow, that's very powerful, um, Peter. 
I thank you so much for taking the time out to come along and to share your worldly advice, your enthusiasm, your attitude. Um, to know that you can fail happy, I think is so reassuring. And the fact that the dragon is within us and we can conquer it. And once we do that, we're unstoppable, I think um, is amazing. Uh, so yeah, I'm saying thank, thanks to you personally, but also just for, on behalf of the listeners as well. Um, if our listeners want to connect with you, find out what you're up to, support your causes, where can we send them? Well, they can send, they can head straight to my PayPal account, but uh, <laughs> short of that, <laughs> um, uh, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, probably more Instagram is kind of my thing at the moment. So yeah, just head across there, Peter Tofu at Instagram. P I T A will get me there. He'll get you there. Well, well yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you, own it. you own the four letter word. Um, we'll put a link to that in the show notes as well as some of the videos. Oh, I can't wait to see your kayaking experience. Again, you're a legend. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me.